Now recording. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Consciousness Hour show. Um, this particular show I've been looking forward to for some time, in that probably for the last 10 years of my life, I've been heavily involved in uh, research into the phenomenon known as near-death experience. Indeed, um, many years ago, my first break in writing was when uh, Professor um, Bruce Grayson, who is Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Virginia, uh, approached me and suggested that I could write an article, or he'd like me to write an article for the International uh, Association of Near-Death Studies in-house academic magazine. Um, and this was the first time that the concept of cheating the ferrying was written about, and I was delighted with the response I had to that particular paper. And in, to cut a long story short, effectively that paper became my first book, Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When We Die. Now, over the years, um, I'd researched and read a great deal about the subject, and one of the names that kept coming up time and time again was Dr. Penny Satori. And um, I was aware that Penny lived in South Wales, so I was very much aware of the fact that uh, she was within the British Isles. And it was unusual to come across a researcher in the United Kingdom. I'm aware of people like Peter Fenwick and other individuals, but um, Penny seemed to be doing some very, very interesting work because she was in the field, as it were. And she was actually working directly with individuals who were uh, towards the, 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 the final stages of their lives. So here was somebody who was dealing on a daily basis with these issues. And clearly it was somebody that whose, whose um, ex experiences and appreciation of the subject were very, very personal and upfront. Now, I've been for a long time hoping to get Penny on the show. Um, and fortunately... We managed to invite her onto the show, and she's our guest today. But what I'm really pleased, and I'd really like to thank Penny for this, is that I know that she has had the most hectic two or three weeks, because um, from her new book, which was launched a few weeks ago, The Wisdom of the Near Death Experience, uh, her publisher, Watkins Publishing, managed to negotiate a deal whereby um, sections of the book were published in one of the major British newspapers, the Daily Mail. Now, it wasn't expected, they were not expecting, I think, the level of interest in the subject that uh, came about, because both Penny and I are very much aware of the fact that near-death experience fascinates people. And the reason it fascinates people is that either somebody has had a near-death experience or similar experience, or they know somebody who has. One of the things I find fascinating is whenever I do my lectures around the country, I will guarantee there will be at least two or three people in the audience who have had direct experiences of this phenomenon. And this is what makes the phenomenon so fascinating, in the sense that unlike other, let's term it esoteric phenomenon, extreme phenomenon, noetic phenomenon, the thing is with the near-death experience is it seems to be consistent across cultures, and it seems to have been consistent throughout history. Now, if something is that consistent and individuals report the same experience, now by the same experience, for example, I stress the fact that young children have near-death experiences, young children who have never read a book on near-death experiences at all, and yet they describe exactly the same phenomenon. So clearly what we have here is a very real, albeit subjective, experience that individuals have during times of great stress or when death is approaching. Now, it is scientifically correct when we come across these phenomena to pursue them. And it's bad science to just dismiss them because they don't fit in with the present paradigm. And there are many, many individuals out there who are bravely pushing the envelope in terms of this. And Dr. Penny Satori is one of these individuals. I've long admired her work, and I'm now delighted to say that we both share the same publisher as well, Watkins. Um, and in, indeed, you know, the sort of various other areas of contract, contact that we've recently discovered as well. Now, without further ado, what I'd like to do is to, to, to introduce Penny and say thank you for joining us. So, Penny, very much welcome to the Consciousness Hour show. Oh, hi. Thanks for having me. Great, great. It's great to have you here. Now, what I'd like to do is, um, just, just to explain a little bit of background, uh, when Pe Penny and I were recently in contact, because I'm researching material for a book I've recently finished that I'm co-authoring with Professor Irving Laszlo, and in this book we're discussing evidence, is there evidence indeed for the argument that consciousness exists outside of the brain? 
And Penny and I had a long discussion about this, and she she informed me of some amazing cases that she'd come across. And what I'd like to do, Penny, is because your first experiences of near-death experience or your experiences of, of on a ward where people were terminally ill, I think were quite astounding. And I'd really like to, to for you to explain again the things you explained to me when you were on that first night as a, as, as a rookie nurse and, and what took place. Well, that was one morning. I'd, uh, it was my first day on the ward as a student nurse, and I was sitting in the office, and we were having a handover. So the night nurse had reported that the man in uh, bed six would probably die by the end of the morning because he'd been talking to his dead mother since about three o'clock in the morning. And I just thought, are they trying to wind me up? It's my first day here. And I looked around and everyone else had carried on writing as if it was the most normal thing to say. And I went, after we'd had the report, I went out into the uh, section where this man's bed was. And I looked at him and he just appeared to be kind of um, sleeping at the time. But I kept going back to him throughout the morning. And yes, I could see he was clearly gesturing to someone and talking to someone who I couldn't see. And this happened quite a lot. And I was really curious about it. And I kept going back and forth. And then it was about half past 11 in the morning. And I went up to him and... It's as if he got a little bit of energy from somewhere when he tried to sit up and he had his arms open and he was smiling. He had a lovely smile on his face and then he sat up a bit and then he just lay, lay down and lay, up, lay back down as if he'd gone to sleep and then he actually died. And I thought, well, that was everything the nurse said on the night shift. He'd be dead by the end of the morning. And yeah, it was. That happened. And so I just thought, wow. That was just something that always stuck with me then, I guess. So perhaps that made me kind of more aware of these experiences. But as my career developed, especially when I was on the wards, I used to see it quite frequently where dying patients would kind of talk or gesture or communicate with people I couldn't see. This, this again is intriguing because the phenomenon you're talking about is technically known as you're probably, well, you will be aware, but the audience may not, is the Pekindarian experience. And the, the idea that, that people, when they're approaching death, see other individuals that have passed over. And it seems to be a very, very common phenomenon. I mean, when, when the other nurses and the, the other medical staff were discussing this, did you then follow it up? Did, 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 you, did you find that it was quite quite common within your peer group of these kind of experiences or were you just sensitive to it? No, it was common to all of my colleagues really. It's quite commonly accepted amongst most nurses. I'm sure there'll be nurses watching this and I'm sure they can identify with people, um, patients they've looked after who have had these kind of visions. I know I've got some colleagues who work in the hospice environment and they pay particular attention to this. They have a particular interest and um, they notice, you know, if, if patients are having these kind of experiences. And what is important is that because they're so open to these experiences now, they actually pass this on to the next shift. So they describe what's happened during that shift for the patient. And they also say, well, actually, they've also been having some visions as well. And usually what they find is within about three Three days of having these visions, the pa patient usually passes on and dies after that. So the onset is usually around about three days. There are exceptions. Some people see people a bit sooner than that. But generally, from three days onwards, they know that there's a high chance that the patient will die quite soon then. Because this is, again, intriguing, isn't it? Because what is happening here is it is an observed phenomenon that medical professionals are aware of. And in fact adapt their behaviours and adapt the way they approach the patient depending upon whether these things are reported back by the patient. Now, to me, again, this is good science because effectively all that is happening here is that a phenomenon is being observed and is being reacted to in a consistent way by professionals. So clearly this phenomenon is significant and it has significance. Now, clearly for you, it had profound significance because this seemed to make you become more aware of what happens to individuals as they approach death. So what did you do then? So did you, did you then start pursuing these interests or how did you follow up from, from, from these initial experiences 
to, to becoming a fully fledged uh, researcher in the near death experience area? Well, I, I started reading even more about these then, and I looked, had there been scientific studies done into this? And in fact, there was one done in the 70s, which was done by Professor Erlanda Haraldson and Carlis Osis. And they published a book called At the Hour of Death, and it described these kinds of visions as well. And it was cross-cultural, so it was done in India and America. So there's, that's a, that was a really good resource for me as well. And in fact, a lot of what I was reading was confirming things that I actually saw through the course of my nursing career as well. So I looked at that and... Then I also then became curious in the acute phases where people have this acute phase of a near-death experience. Now, this could be due to a cardiac arrest or some sort of accident or some em medical emergency. And that really interested me because these people, they were approaching death. They, In some cases, their heart stopped, but then they were revived and they came back and reported something else as well. And that really got my interest because scientifically it, that shouldn't be possible if your heart is stopped and your brain is not getting the oxygen to it you should we shouldn't have any conscious experience according to the current view that consciousness is produced by the brain but what these people were saying was that they were having a conscious experience so if you think about it a lot of the near-death experiences at that point that i was reading about had all been reported anecdotally so there was no way of really checking how close to death these people had become and then i thought well if we do this in a hospital setting we have the ability then to check if the patient really had had, if their heart had stopped and if events that they had reported really were happening? Did they happen at the time? We could check this with the staff who were present at the time of the resuscitation. So I just thought, well, there's so many cardiac arrests that I had attended in intensive care, and it was just perfect for me to be able to do this research where I worked, because there was ways then for me to go and check if what the patients were saying were actually correct. So that's how my research developed, really. Did you have any opposition from uh, physicians and your, your peers in terms of the work you were doing? No, I was really lucky because I worked at a, an excellent unit and I think the everyone there was a bit, little bit you know, curious and a bit sceptical about it initially. But the more I explained about it and how I was going to go about it, they were really very supportive. So I was lucky that I had excellent colleagues as well who were so supportive of what I was doing. And in the beginning, you know, um, it was a little bit sort of taking the mickey, really, a bit like the X-Files thing. But as it progressed, they were really, really interested and they took a big interest in this. So I think it really did inform my colleagues as well. And as a result, it informed the way that they continued their practice as well. So I think people were more kind of um, looking out for patients who had this experience and were more better to support and um, able to support them if they reported the near-death experience. So I think it did raise a lot of awareness about these experiences and thankfully now patients are a lot more supported than they were say 20 years ago. That is that is excellent news um, because am I right in, in, in recalling that your PhD tutor was Peter Fennick, is that correct? I know that Peter has been a great help to you but was right yes. because just and again... really lucky, yeah. I had two um, supervisors for the research. One of them was Professor Paul Badham and the other one was Dr. Peter Fennick. So it was great to have such great support from the beginning as well. Yes, because I can imagine they, they, they would know exactly what you were, you were talking about, being experienced researchers in that area themselves. And just again for the listeners, you know, that people like Peter Fennick, for instance, is one of the world's, definitely Britain's, if not one of the world's leading authorities on, on epilepsy in children and various other special and other areas as well. So we're not talking here about people who are dealing with a borderline of science. These are actually professionals. I mean, Peter, I guess, is at the Maudsley, I think, as I recall. Um, yeah, he was. He's retired now. So, um, but oh, he was, he? he's a neurophysiologist and neuropsychiatrist. And so his qualifications and his experience are immense. So I was so lucky that he was one of my supervisors. 
Yes, because this is one of the fascinating things, isn't it, that when you get the uh, materialist reductionist sceptics, what they do is they keep changing the rules. So what they'll turn around and they'll say is, oh, you're not qualified to write about this material. And then effectively when there is somebody who is qualified to uh, write about the material, such as Peter Fennig, they will then turn around and say, oh, he's somehow lost the plot and somehow he's abdicating his responsibility as a scientist by pursuing these things. So what effectively you get is this self-fulfilling prediction that effectively anybody who's interested in this material cannot be a scientist because we have decided so because they're actually taking they're actually interested in things that do not support or are not supported by the present paradigm but of course one of the major areas of near death experience that is virtually irrefutable is what is called veridical uh, experiences where individuals have near death experiences whereby they report information and claim to see things that they cannot see or could not have ordinarily seen. And I know one of the most cited cases in the literature that I'm aware of anyway is very much your patient 10 um, case. And if anybody's not heard this before, it is well worth listening to. And Penny was witness to this and has actually written this up many times. Now, I'd be really delighted, Penny, if you could explain in detail exactly what happened in the patient 10 case and why it is such an important case. Right. Well, with patient 10, I was looking after him on a morning shift and it was decided that we'd sit him into the chair. And so the physiotherapist came along and a group of us and we sat him in the chair and I realised his condition was deteriorating shortly after he sat there. And um, the alarm, the monitor alarmed and it showed that his oxygen was decreasing a little bit. So I got what we call an ambu bag and I squeezed some extra oxygen into his tracheostomy and that resolved. And he started to become grey and cold and clammy. And it was all the signs, really, of an ensuing cardiac arrest. And then his heart rate went into a very fast rhythm very briefly and his blood pressure started to drop. And I thought that if we didn't get this man back into bed very quickly, he'd have a cardiac arrest in the chair. So I called my colleagues and um, we literally flung this man back into bed at that point. And as soon as we got him back into bed, he was deeply unconscious. He wasn't responding to deep, painful stimuli or to me calling his name. Now, with deep, painful stimuli, we usually um, press like a, um, a pen into the nail bed and that the patient will withdraw their fingers usually. But nothing was happening. He was not responding at all. So the doctor came. It was a junior doctor and examined him, but he prescribed some fluid for his blood pressure. And then he had to leave because he was attending another emergency. So his blood pressure had stabilised out, and um, but then it started to drop again. So I thought, right, I need to get someone else to have a look. And as I walked to, my colleagues were keeping an eye on my patient at the time, and I called, luckily the consultant happened to be walking into the unit at that point. So I said, quick, can you come and review my patient? So he came and he examined him and he said, have you checked his pupils? At that point, I hadn't had chance. So he got a pen and torch and he shone the pen and torch into the patient's eyes to check that they were reacting, which they were. And um, he prescribed some more fluid. And at that point, his, his, he started to stabilise. And so he stayed around the bedside for a while and he could see that the patient state was stable at this point. So the consultant then went back to his office and um, the physiotherapist was in the background as well. And she was poking her head around the curtains to check on his condition. And um, after about 30 minutes, um, I pulled the I, I pulled the screens back then after 30 minutes because I could see he was beginning to regain consciousness. His um, he started to move his limbs and his eyelids started to flicker. So that's a sign that you're regaining consciousness. But he was still not responding fully to anything that we were asking him or calling his name. And but it was about a total then of another three and a half hours. So four hours later, he completely regained consciousness and. It was at the point when the ward round were coming to his bed space. Now, this was a group of doctors and physiotherapists and the nursing sister. And as soon as he saw them, he was trying to communicate something to them. And he described that he had died and he'd watched it all from above. And the, the consultant immediately said, oh, you'd better tell Penny about that. She's interested. And... Um, 
he described that he pointed to the consultant and said that it, it was him that had looked into his eyes. He pointed to the physiotherapist and said that she'd been poking her head around the screens, looking very nervous and hiding behind the screens, which she was. And he also described me cleaning his mouth with something long and pink. Now, this is correct. Um, everything that he described from an out-of-body perspective actually did happen. And I know it happened because I was there at the time that it happened. He also described um, going into a room that was pink, where he met his dead father, um, a, a man he didn't know, he didn't recognise, but it could have been Jesus, he's not sure, but the man had long hair and he had very piercing eyes as well. And there was also a lady there who he wasn't really sure who she was, but then he re later identified her as being his dead mother-in-law, who he'd never met, but recognised her from photographs. And he said he was really happy where he was, very peaceful, very calm. And then he said he wanted to go to his father. His father was calling him. But the Jesus type figure said, no, it's not your time. You have to go back. And as soon as he said that, he said he felt himself floating backwards into his body and the image faded in front of him. And as soon as he was back in his body, he was in immediate pain. And he said it was such bad pain that he wished he was dead. And the interesting thing about this case as well is that something I didn't pick up on initially, it was at a follow up interview where he misinterpreted one of my questions. Now, my question was, could you do something when you're out of your body that you can't normally do? Now, by that, I was thinking about some people who report thinking of a, a location, say the pyramids of Egypt and instantly finding themselves there. So that's what I was getting at. But he misinterpreted and he said, oh, look. Yes, I can open out my hand. So his right hand, this man has cerebral palsy. So he was 60 years of age at the time of his experience and his right hand had been in a permanently contracted position all of his life. And then after this experience, he can now fully open out his hand. And that shouldn't physiologically be possible. We at the moment, we don't have any explanation for it. I asked the doctor if he knew of how this could have happened and I asked the physio and they all agreed that it's something that really shouldn't be possible without an operation to release the tendons. But no such operation was done. I checked in his notes. I checked in his physio notes. Had he had any extra hand physio for it? But he hadn't. So no one could understand how that had happened as well. So I think that's a really interesting aspect of this case. There are, there are some interesting issues there, I think, and the one that intrigues me more than anything else is that the way in which he was able to report back to you incidents he had perceived from a, an extracorporeal position, presumably near the ceiling or the roof looking down. Now, just to confirm, could he have seen the, the device that you put into his mouth before? Could he have subconsciously even seen it in the ward or in a tray or something like that? Yes, he could have. Now, when I've, I've written this up in an article for the Journal of Near-Death Studies, so I kind of look at all the possibilities. You know, I try to think, is there a rational explanation for this? And yes, you know, he was well aware of what we use to clean his mouth. But usually I use um, like a pink sponge and that would moisten his lips. That would be dipped in water. But because he'd actually drooled from the side of his mouth a lot of secretions, I'd first of all use a little soft suction catheter and that had suctioned all these secretions away. And then I put the pink lollipop in. So the sec actually the secretions were quite pink as well. And what he described seeing was something long and pink in his mouth. Well, that was true. That did happen. But of course, you know, he was aware of the routine and he did know that that's the kind of thing that I used. But the interesting thing for me was that he correctly identified the consultant as the person who examined him. Now, prior to losing consciousness, he'd only seen the other junior doctors. The consultant hadn't even arrived on the unit at that point. And then the consultant had returned to his office once he was satisfied that the patient's condition was stable. So the patient didn't see the consultant until he was on the ward round later that day. So that was an interesting aspect, that it was a consultant and not the other doctors that he actually did 
you know, uh, report. Um, and also the physiotherapist as well, poking her head around the curtains. Now, she did this, and this occurred during the 30 minutes when the screens were pulled around the bed and he was deeply unconscious and not responding to anything at all. So, you know, how, how could that be possible? He, he actually described events which did happen while I was there, and I know they happened because I was actually there. You know, it's not something that was just anecdotally reported it was while I was there that this happened so that's something I can't explain and I think we we just need to kind of open our minds and look for other possibilities and other explanations and for me I think the the most logical explanation now having tried to look at all the explanations that I do have is that we need we need to open our minds about consciousness you know what it what is consciousness and is it really produced by the brain or is it merely mediated through it and I think maybe we need to sort of do more investigation into the possibility of consciousness being mediated through the brain rather than being created by the brain because if you think about it you know patients who are unconscious their brains are severely physiologically insulted so they shouldn't be having any kind of clear experience i've been i've nursed patients thousands of patients who are unconscious and as they regain consciousness they, they're groggy for a long time they're very vague some of them don't have any recollection of being unconscious and it's something you know there's in, impaired intellectual ability in, initially as someone's regaining consciousness but with this patient you know as soon as he regained full consciousness it did take him three and a half hours to regain that full consciousness but he was very clear about what he reported what had occurred to him during the time that he was unconscious was very clear and he reported it with great clarity and great lucidity and he described it as being realer than real so he's describing a heightened state of awareness when his brain is physiologically insulted. And so we don't really understand how that can happen. So I think, you know, we really do need to open our minds and we need to look at other explanations for consciousness. When he described the doctor, uh, the, the specialist, did he, did he describe what the specialist looked like, the, 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 you know, the physical characteristics of that person, or did he just say another doctor came in? No, he pointed to him. So as soon as the ward round approached his bed area, there was a group of doctors and, there were, you know, there were about four, three doctors there. There was physiotherapist, the nursing sister, and it was the consultant who he pointed at. It was him. He was very clear and very definite and specific about who it was. The other doctors who had been present before he lost consciousness were also on the ward round. But it wasn't those that he pointed at. It was clearly the consultant who he did point at. And he described his actions as well. He described him looking in his eyes, shining the torch. And um, he also described what he said. But actually what he said the doctor had said was that there's no life in the eye. Well, the doctor didn't actually say that, but he, it was a good interpretation of what the doctor meant. The doctor said something like... Uh, his pupils are reacting. One of them is bigger than the other. That's what he said, something like that. I'd have to go back to my notes to check that to be precise on that. But um, so if it was just due to auditory cues, I would expect him to get the consultant's words correct as well. So that, that's a very good point, isn't it? Yeah, because it was just auditory, mm -hmm. because the major argument that is, is used is to say that when somebody is in these states, there is some part of them that is aware, and therefore there's some kind of peripheral awareness going on. And what the individual mm -hmm. does is they confabulate and create um, a, a narrative of the experiences mm -hmm. they've had. You know, they might be in a hypnagogic state, there might be various other things. However, one of the things, uh, funnily enough, I was discussing this with a, with a specialist recently, and one of the arguments I've used against, for instance, the, the famed Pam Reynolds case, uh, which I feature in my book, The Out of the Body Experience, um, I had certain issues with the Pam Reynolds case, and one of the things I suggested was that, and it wasn't original, of course, because it wouldn't be, but I suggested that 
clearly there is evidence to presume that a lot of the near-death experiences, and Pam Reynolds gives a case as an example, that it's when the person is coming out of the, the, the anesthesia that they start to go into a hypnopompic state, and in the hypnopompic state they actually create a dream based upon the, the patchwork of experiences from the subliminal uh, appreciation of information coming in that they create. However, this specialist told me quite, quite specifically and said that this is not possible because the way in which the, the anesthetics themselves scramble the way in which consciousness works, there isn't any dream state when somebody's coming out of a deep anesthetic state. So therefore, the argument to say that it is some kind of dream sequence is, is invalidated. But the major argument is even more powerful is presumably his eyes were closed. So therefore, he was yeah. identifying visual cues and the things he was seeing. Now, in terms of the, 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 the physiotherapist, um, he, the, the, he, the, the, he could not have seen the physiotherapist, A, because his eyes were closed, and B, because she was probably standing outside of his normal visual field anyway, because she was behind the curtains. Yeah, that's so right. So here we... Okay. You know, she so was here completely... Again, sorry. Sorry, Penny, yeah. Yeah, she was completely out of his visual field. She was behind screens. He described her as poking her head around them, which she was. And, you know, he, he was lying flat on the bed as well. So, and his eyes were closed. So he couldn't have seen her from the position that he was. That's an interesting point. So he was lying flat on his back with his face looking upwards effectively. So yeah. the, 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 he couldn't have even been in his peripheral vision because he was too low, and yet he was quite specific. And I remember when I was actually reading your narrative of this, you know, that she was extremely agitated because she felt vaguely responsible because she'd got him up mm -hmm. too soon to do exercises and things. So clearly here we have veridical proof of somebody perceiving things when neurologically the brain isn't active enough to be taking in these stimuli. Now, I know of cases, for instance, like the Pam Reynolds case, whereby her EEG was effectively flattened at the time, and she reported certain perceptions. And I know there is arguments to say, and I completely accept these arguments, that a lot of what Pam Reynolds reported, she could have heard before she went into the standby situation, where her body temperature was brought down to 60 degrees, and her blood was taken out of her body and everything else. So there's an argument to say that. But there is no way of explaining how these perceptions take place. So we do have something here that it, it is massively important that we don't just dismiss it because it happens time and time and time again, and it is bad science. Now, effectively, you're in the position here, as you've rightly said, you have empirically proven to yourself as a scientist that these events took place because you experienced them, literally empirically experienced them and saw them happen. Now, I know from your papers how methodical you have been in making sure that you do follow up every other alternatives before you come to your conclusions. So you're, you're very, very precise in this. And I think it's profoundly important that we look at these things scientifically. And again, your, your very perceptive point about is the brain some form of something that attunes into something else and we are confusing things because we're assuming purely and simply because of the perceptual way we perceive the universe, i.e. we look out of our eyes and we hear things through our ears, we naturally assume that we are located, you know, two or three centimetres behind our eyes. But that is very much as much an illusion as anything else. You know, there is the argument to say that the brain, we are measuring brain reactions, and we can do EEGs, and we can do MRI scans, and fMRI scans, and everything else, which can give us very, very precise pictures of what is happening in the brain. But that is the same argument as saying you could take the back off an old television set, and you'd see the valves lighting up in certain ways and certain sequences. But that didn't prove that the TV studio was inside the TV. And there is this value error here, and a, an error of logic. Now, from this... You, you were then motivated to undertake the studies which uh, the wisdom of the near-death near experience, your new book, discusses. So when people now, from your research, people when they have NDEs, and it's funnily enough, there was something I was asked, I did a, I did a talk at a, a school recently, and one of the questions I was asked was, do people 
always have pleasant NDEs because the general consensus is if you know you go up to your version of heaven and there is this argument isn't it you know it's very culturally biased in terms of the experiences people have but it could be argued that the experience adapts itself to the cultural cultural mores of the individuals experiencing it doesn't invalidate the experience just because it's culturally biased but effectively are there other experiences that are not pleasant? Have you come across any cases of individuals that have had unpleasant NDE experiences? Yes, yes, I have. And in fact, there were two in my research in the hospital. Um, they've been classified. Now, Professor Bruce Grayson and Nancy Evans Bush have done some work on this. And they classified these experiences. And also Dr. Margot Gray in the, in the UK has done some work on these. Uh, they classified as um, the initial experience of a near-death experience, but it's interpreted in a frightening way. Then there's the void experience, and this can be commonly reported in child cases of childbirth and complications of childbirth. And in the void experience, the person just feels they're in this eternal nothingness, eternal void. And one person who I've met actually um, just quite recently described her experience, and she described it as being eternal boredom. And then there's the third type, which is actually like a hellish type of experience where a person feels that they're in hell and being dragged down by demons. Now, in my research in the hospital, I came across two experiences. The first kind was of the usual kind of experience, but the lady interpreted it in a very unpleasant way. So she felt that she'd left her body. She felt that she was looking down on herself as well. And then she felt herself drifting off towards a river. And she said she's really frightened of water. So there was this bridge across the river. And as she got closer to it, she could hear voices in the background. And they were like children mocking her. And she said she, and the closer she got to this water, the more terrified she became. And then all of a sudden the voices were there. She could hear this mocking and the laughter. And then all of a sudden she just woke up and she was back in her body. And she said there was nothing pleasant about that at all. And then there's the second type. Um, the second case that I came across was a lady who had a cardiac arrest and she believed that she was in hell. And it started off where she could see lots of um, she was on a could see a lady rowing a boat on a river and or a stream. And she could see lots of um we, like a, a Catherine wheel, she described it, a very bright colour spinning around and then there was a mist and then she could feel heat and it was tremendous heat. And then she started to become really distressed and she said it was it was hell. I was looking into hell. I was looking into the flames of hell. And as she started to describe this, she got more and more upset. And in fact, she got so upset that I had to terminate the interview because it was causing her so much trauma, just the recall of it. And I went back to see her two days later and she said, I don't want to talk about it. She said, just thinking about it is just upsetting me. She said, I don't. And she was like, she was really distressed by this and she was begging me to reassure her that she was going to be OK. And so I think with these experiences, we really do need to, to learn more so that we can support these patients. This woman was severely traumatized. And um, and there's other cases in, in the literature where people report this trauma, having had this experience of being in hell. And in fact, a lot of people are afraid to talk about these experiences, so they don't get as commonly reported as these pleasant experiences. So I think it's really important that we really do do some more work into these unpleasant experiences as well. And there's been sort of lots of um, ideas. Is, is it because these people were bad people? Well, it's not. There's no evidence to su suggest that the people who have the unpleasant experiences, there's anything wrong with the, their moral character or anything like that. Um, there's been one suggestion that it's maybe failure to relinquish the ego. It's the fighting of the death that actually is making it so traumatic. And there are some cases where people have kind of let go of that fighting and relaxed into the experience and it's turned into a pleasant experience. And um, there's a recent case, actually, Dr. Rajiv Party 
He was an, is an anaesthetist in California, and he's writing his book on a near-death experience. And it started off with him being quite unpleasant, where he felt that he was being dragged into this hell-like place. And as soon as he realised, he had this realisation that the way he'd been living his life was without forgiveness. And as soon as he started to realise about his life, it turned into a very pleasant experience. So I think we need to kind of really look in more depth at these experiences because there's another aspect um, which was explored by Professor Christopher Barsh and he has explored the possibility that these might be the person is tuning into the collective unconscious and accessing this collective unconscious state which is what they it's not their personal unconscious but the collective unconscious of mankind which is why they're experiencing a really frightening experience so i think we need to do so much more work on these experiences i, I totally agree i mean i don't know if you're aware of the the book that uh, i co-edited with uh, dr Pereira and dr jack adizen uh, called making sense of near-death experience and in that, we have uh, 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 Dr. Pereira's section was very much about professionals and clinicians being aware of the near-death experience and being aware that it, it is a traumatic experience. And when an individual has these experiences, they really want to talk about them. You know, and effectively what tends to happen is that they're dismissed, you know, and they're saying, oh, it's just it's it, it's just, just some kind of side effect of the trauma you've been through. And these individuals really need catharsis. They need to talk about them because it helps them in many, many ways. Um, I'm also like uh, really interested in picking up on the point you make about the, the, the tying, uh, the picking up of information from the collective unconscious, um, because some of the work I'm doing with Professor Irvin Laszlo is Laszlo's um, Akashic paradigm and the Akashic field and the idea that information in the term of, used by uh, Professor David Bohm is that that, that information is actually encoded within the zero point field and under certain circumstances an individual when they're in these liminal states such as near death experiences, out of the body experiences, lucid dreaming, these kind of things are actually picking up information from this field of information and, and are processing that information in whatever their psychological state makes them do. Now effectively one could argue that dying is a very very traumatic experience uh, and we have to argue, for instance, that there are massive parallels historically. We have the Bardo state. We have the idea of, of unpleasant going to hell and everything else from the, 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 the religious backgrounds of individuals. So clearly there's a kind of a confabulation and a creation of uh, a circumstance when we're in these kind of liminal states. But it doesn't invalidate the experience for that individual because they are such a, such a traumatic experience and effectively an experience that will completely change the way in which you see consensual reality that we all share and we all assume is the only reality there is. So my next question is to you that I know that you, 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 you deal with many people who've had profound NDAs what, do they, does it change them? Does, it, does their worldview change? And, you know, do you have examples of how individuals have, have become positive or indeed negative after these experiences? Yes, there's loads of cases where people have completely changed as a result. Um, some people do actually have the negative after effects as well, where they find it very difficult to integrate what they've exp experienced into their life from then on. You know, the, the values can change so much that they no longer have anything in common with their spouse, for example. And so there can be quite a high divorce rate as well. Um, but yeah, the, the the values change. They they may want to they may be inspired to give up their career. They may have been high earners and earned lots of money before, whereas all of a sudden that doesn't mean anything to them anymore. It's it's simple things in life, you know, spending time with your family. And um, some people change careers and train to become nurses or just become carers as a result of what they've experienced. I know someone now who's actually 
as a result of direct result of having had her near death experience, she is now going to undertake some training to become a soul midwife so she can sit with people as they are dying so she can be of comfort and of help to them as as the patients are dying. So it can have really profound effects on people as well. And there can also be like um, a big psychological boost as well. Now, there is one lady that I mention in my book. I call her Sally in the book. And she had a near-death experience um, when she suffered a severe head injury. Now, the head injury was so bad that she wasn't expected to survive. Um, the doctors told her husband that if she did survive, in the unlikely event that she did survive, she would have to learn to walk again because of the extent of the head injury. And this lady was an amateur athlete. Now, during the time she was unconscious, she had this near-death experience where she was in the presence of a voice. And um, the voice said to her, you have a choice. You can either stay here or you can go back. And she didn't know whether she consciously made a choice. All she remembers is waking up in the hospital. And the voice also said, if you if you choose to go back, you will be stronger. And she woke up in the hospital and it took her a while to recognise her husband and recognise the rest of her family. And that voice was always with her. And she said it was a very, whenever I speak to her, she gets very emotional about the experience. And she just closes her eyes and it's as if she's reliving it again. And it's ha it has a deep emotional impact on her. And she said this voice kept saying, if you go back, you will be stronger. And that stayed with her. And the remarkable thing about this is that the lady did survive, despite the odds. And she learned to walk again. And she actually, within a month of being discharged from hospital, ran a 10 kilometre race. But further to that, she actually then went, she was in the Guinness Book of Records three times for her achievements because she became an ultra distance runner. And her greatest achievement is running across Australia from Sydney to Melbourne, which is 625 miles. And she did that in eight days without any sleep. And I think that is phenomenal. And she did, she said, you know, the thing that kept her going was tuning into that experience. She just tunes into that experience. That voice is with her constantly. And that's how she achieves what she does. I saw her the last time I met with a lady was about 18 months ago. And she said, oh, could you drop me off on your way? I want to go for a quick run. And she's in her late 60s now. And a quick run for her was about um, 20 miles. So that was just like a quick little run, you know. So she said she totally tunes into this voice and she's it's with her all the time. So it, it has such an impact, you know, people who take near death experiences at surface value don't realise the deep implications of what these experiences mean for some of the people, you know. Totally, because effectively it's like probably any noetic experience or the oceanic effect uh, that mystics have talked about for millennia. It's the idea, isn't it, that suddenly we realise that what we take to be this reality is part of nested realities and there are many other levels of reality that we can access under certain circumstances and the major difficulty has always been that individuals when they bring when they have these experiences to try and explain them to the individuals who have not had the experience is virtually impossible I'm reminded of Plato's cave, the old idea of, you know, the prisoners that are kept in a cave and, um, you know, all their perceptions for the whole of their lives from the moment of their birth have been actually watching shadow play on the back of the cave, from, you know, reflections from a fire. But effectively, if one of the prisoners is released and is given the opportunity to go outside of the cave to perceive the reality that it really is, and then they are given the opportunity to go back into the cave to speak to their fellow prisoners, the fellow prisoners will mock them and say, you know, that how can you possibly say you've seen these things? You have no proof of them. But the individual knows through veridical, through um, real personal experience of the reality of these things. And I know from people I've spoken to who've had near-death experiences, I, I have had the same responses. You know, the idea is I am a changed individual now. I realize that everything is one, that everything you do has a cause and effect. I, f I feel the sensation sometimes and I realize that what I do to other people will come back to me because I will feel the pain from other people as well. Now, one of the things, again, you pointed out there, again, that um, fascinated me was 
the idea of the voice that is with the lady afterwards, you know, and this kind of presence, as if the person before the near-death experience was a unitary person, and now they've become binary, as if, you know, there are two parts to them, one of which is communicating to them continually. Now, of course, in my book, The Daemon, A Guide to Your Extraordinary Secret Self, I very much tie up this idea of this, this voice that people hear, this guiding spirit that becomes part of them. And I suggest that this guiding spirit is, in effect, a manifestation of their own superego, for want of a better term, their soul, their immortal parts of themselves, that actually becomes manifest after a near-death experience, whereas it's been latent through the life until a near-death experience takes place. Now, of course, this would explain many experiences that individuals have because suddenly they do not feel alone. It's as if, again, they're tuning into this reality. Now, from this, you know, that both from my books and the work you've done in your books, clearly the, the NDE can tell us something about the human condition without necessarily abdicating our scientific viewpoint because nobody's abdicating that. What we're saying is that these experiences do have validity, they do have importance, and they can tell us something about what it is to be human. Now, from your experiences and your research, what do you think is the significance of the NDE? What does the NDE really mean? Well, it, as you said, it makes people think differently. And instead of seeing themselves as separate beings, they realize that they are not separate. We are all one. And particularly during the life review aspect of the near-death experience, for example, they actually relive their life where they feel what their the impact of their actions has had on other people. So, for example, if someone has been particularly unpleasant or even violent towards someone else, they feel like what it's like to be on the receiving end of that they can feel how that feels to have the violence inflicted on them or even just nasty words said against them they feel what it's like and they they judge themselves sometimes during the life review there is a presence with them and they feel that the presence is watching the life review as well but the purpose of the presence is it a comfort in some respects because the people are so appalled by how they've behaved in their life but it, they can also feel what it's like to be on the receiving end of good that they've done as well. So they get a whole perspective of what their actions have been like. And I think the deep thing about this is that ev nearly everyone I've spoken to who's had the near-death experience has said that we're all interconnected. So what we do to others, ultimately, we do to ourselves. And that is something that is really of great importance that they bring back with them. And if you think about it, that is the message of all of the wisdom traditions anyway. You know, it's treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself. And it's it's like a law of nature, really. If you adhere to it, you know, things go in the right way. And I think that's something that we really do need to kind of take a notice of as well. And that's something that's really had a big impact on me and made me think a great deal about my actions as well. And I just think if we all treated each other with that respect that the world could be a very different place anyway, couldn't it? Totally, because this, I think this is the, well, it's not the great secret. I think it's the, it's, it is what we are here to be taught. It is, mm -hmm. and to, 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 to learn is to be aware of the fact that we are effectively one unity and everything we do has an effect and we feel it. I mean, I'm reminded of um, a friend of mine who had a profound near-death experience where he was drowning off the sea in Dawlish, a guy called Bill Murther, William Murther. And he, while he was drowning and dying of hypothermia, he, he was back in his childhood and he was running across a road in the east end of London. And as he was running across the road, he looks up to see a car careering towards him. And he gets hit by the car. And he gets knocked unconscious, had all those sensations. And the next minute, and this is really odd, and this is a guy that didn't know about near-death experiences or anything else. He, he was a very grounded guy making money. You know, he was very much of that ilk. And he said that he was suddenly looking down at somebody's stockinged leg and there was a ladder in the stocking and with long fingernails the person was picking at the stocking 
And he then realised, because he could see a gear stick, and he realised it was somebody in a car. Just as she looks up to see Will running across the road in front of her, and she hits him. And he then sees, from the woman's point of view, coming out of the car and looking down at the crumpled body of this child that she'd hit. And he said, I felt all the things that she felt. And then he was back in the sea again, dying. Now, again, what is interesting here is, again, the manifestation of the voice. You know, again, he, he was guided. This voice was talking to him. And in his book, Dying for Change, Dying for a Change, he discusses this in detail, what this voice said to him. And it showed him alternate futures, the alternate outcomes of what would happen in the future. Now, effectively, one is reminded here of, of all the classic stories of Christmas Carol. So these are kind of universals that are carried through by many, many people. And it is this idea that we, we have this kind of guide. Now, again, in the Daemon, I suggest that the, the being of light that, that takes you through the, the run through of your life, the past life review, the panoramic life review, is very much your own higher self. It's very much the term I use, the ordainment. And it, it, the daemon knows and it needs there to teach you because this is the universal part of you. And this is the part of you that is part. It's what the Gnostics used to call the kind of the shard of the pleroma. It's something that's inside of you that's part of the greater something. And I think these things are learning experiences. The sad thing is that many of us live our lives without having these experiences. And, of course, this is the intriguing question, is, isn't it? You know, that somebody, if you don't have these experiences, you will never, ever expand forward. So do you believe that why it is that certain people have near-death experiences and gain from them, but other individuals live the lives in a negative way without having that opportunity to know the full reality of what we're talking about. And in fact, what do NDEs tell us about the death itself? You know, what, what, you know we've talked about the impact it has on life and living your lives, mm -hmm. but what does it tell us about death? Well, that's a really good question because... These experiences are what occur in the time leading up to death. So they don't really tell us anything about after death, what happens after we die. But the fact that people are having these lucid, clear, conscious experiences, when particularly in cases of cardiac arrest, where there should not be any conscious experience, it would lead us, me to kind of conclude that perhaps our consciousness is not created by the brain. And I think that consciousness is primary. It's there all around us all the time. We're just not aware of it. And I think the brain mediates the consciousness and the brain, if you like, acts like a filter. And so there are certain times in our life when that filter action becomes dysfunctional. And rather than create some hallucinatory experience, because it's not hallucinatory at all, what it's doing is allowing this heightened state of awareness into our everyday consciousness. And I think perhaps that's the way that we really need to guide our research from now on. And I think we have to be open to that possibility because from the research that I've done, that is what currently makes more, most sense to me. And I think that's what we really do need to pursue is the possibility that consciousness is around us all the time. It's um, it's primary and primary um, consciousness is primary and it's mediated through the brain, not created by the brain. Well, there are two things there. I mean, I did, you're probably aware of the, the recent research done by a lady called Jim Oborigin at the University of Michigan. Um, and I don't know if you know about this, where they, they actually were, 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 were um, looking at the brain states of rats and they actually oh, yeah. killed the rats. And there was a, a, a peak of activity approximately about eight seconds after the, the rat was, was, was brain dead anyway. I don't know whether we could argue clinically dead. I think that there's gradations here, I know. But effectively, you know, as Sam Parnia says, you know, death is, a, dying is a process. It's not just an instant at any time. Now, this again suggests that, you know, there is a massive piece of brain activity towards the end of life. Now, of course, we know that time perception is subjective as well, and we know one of the, 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 the moody traits 
in terms of uh, the NDE is the feeling of time slowing down. So effectively, that, that few seconds of brain activity after brain death could effectively accommodate a whole lifetime of individual, you know, or, or an afterlife or whatever we want to call it. And of course, I'm reminded very much because this is very much the, the, uh, the avenue that myself and Laszlo are pursuing. And in fact, um, at the end of March, I'll be, I'll be moderating at um, an event at the University of Milan where Irvin Laszlo has invited a lot of brain researchers and physicists and neurologists together to discuss this idea of, of the brain as an attenuator. You know, it's taking the arguments of Henri Bergson. You know, these are not new ideas, but Henri Bergson was arguing about it. Um, people like uh, Aldous Huxley argued about it in terms of the doors of perception. And it's the idea that the brain is there to stop us perceiving the wider reality. And it is only during noetic experiences or during near-death experiences that for a few seconds we perceive the reality as it really is, the totality of the reality. So in other words, you know, again, I'm reminded of um, what William Blake called the mind forged manacles that were effectively we are trapped within the universe that the brain allows us to perceive. But it is only in terms of, of great stress or whatever or where certain neurotransmitters of the brain react in certain ways to open up these channels of communication. So I think that is very, very true, and I think it's really delightful to hear that we all seem to be going down this same route, you know, that, that life is a single presence, that we are all like waves on a sea, that we're all part of a greater presence, and that under certain circumstances we have the noetic experience of the wider experience. So... To finish off, Penny, what, what, there are two things. First of all, what, what, what does the future hold for you now? Because I'm really intrigued now that there's been so much interest in your work. I mean, you've got a huge springboard now to really make a difference in terms of the, yeah. near, the perception of the near-death experience. So what are your plans for, for the future now? Well, it's interesting, really, because as a result of all the publicity that I've had, there's been some great people who have contacted me with their experiences, and I just think they have got phenomenal cases. There are two that I've come across, which are, I've never come across cases so deep as these, and there is so much I can learn from these people. So what I'd like to do is attract some research funding so that I can study these in great depth in scientific um controlled situations so that we can hopefully have some greater understanding of consciousness. So in recent, that, that's my, my main priority, I think, is to, to really in, research these in great depth because these cases are absolutely incredible, what I've come across. So hopefully I could um, get a team of people even to help me, you know, people who are even sceptical of these experiences. It would be great to get their input on this as well so that we have a rounded view and we can research these in depth. Because I, I don't want to kind of like, it's not about I'm right and you're, you're wrong. It's, it's not about that. I think the way forward is to be have a critical mind, have have scepticism, but also an open mind. So it would be great to have a, a team of researchers on this where we get really great thinking on this and so we can really get do some great science on it as well. So that's something I would really like to do, progress to that. Well, that's, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Okay, so if, if there are the, the listeners, watchers, people who have actually been listening to this, this show, I'm sure there'll be many people out there that are really desperate to contact you to give you their experiences uh, and possibly even assist you in different ways. So how can they contact you? What avenues, where's your website and any other contact details that you want to give out there? Um, because I know that I'm, I'm really excited with what you've done and I, I think you have you have really put the NDE on the map in the UK and you have to be congratulated for that. So my utter congratulations on that. So how can, how can uh, the guys listening into the, uh, the Consciousness Hour contact you and tell, you, tell them and tell you about their experiences? Yeah, I've got a website and on the website is all the details of my contact details. So just contact me through the website. So if you go on to drpennysartori.com and then just contact me through that and I'll, I'll get back to you. I'm currently receiving hundreds of emails every day, but I will get round to replying to every one of them. So um, please be patient. I will reply. 
Wonderful. And thank you very much, Penny, for an absolutely intriguing hour. I am sure that people will be contacting both of us about this when it goes online. And just to say thank you for that. Right. Uh, the next show. Thank, thank you, Penny. The next show uh, will be going out uh, again the, um, the second Sunday of the month. And next month we have Eric Davis, um, who is a, a Gnostic researcher and fascinating writer and an expert on the work of Philip K. Dick. In fact, he was involved in some of the work to do with Philip K. Dick's exegesis. Again, I'm really looking forward to talking to Eric about this. Um, I'm also planning to, in the next week or two, and Dia and I have discussed this, is we're going to have a very, very special guest that we're hoping to have on the show and record a, a special one-off show for some um, developing information um, that I was discussing with this particular individual last week on Skype. And this is going to blow your mind, guys. It really is going to blow your mind. But Penny, thank you very much again for a wonderful hour. And uh, we will have you back because I'm keen to have you back on the show because I'm sure that in the next six months, your life is going to change so dramatically. It's going to be untrue and uh, it's well deserved. <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. and thank you again thank to you. Uh, Dia Nunes over there in Denver, Colorado, for um, facilitating the show, as always. She's the lady in the background, but without her, this just wouldn't happen. Thank you very much, guys.